The gospel this morning from our lectionary text for Trinity Sunday comes to us from the third chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 1 through 8 and 16 through 17. Listen to God's word. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you that no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, But how? How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind Go, the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son, so that everyone who might believe in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you draw near to us through the power of the triune name. You come to us as the one who has created us in your image and created the world around us. You come to us as our Redeemer, with us in the flesh, healing us, forgiving us, embodying your grace. You come to us in the power of the Holy Spirit, that mighty wind that blows among us, dwells within us, and sends us forth into the world to be your people, your body here on earth. Draw near to us now that we might enter the mystery of your promises. Draw near to us now, that we might draw near to you. And we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation on our hearts might be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, so first of all, let me tell you, Sarah has set a high bar. I may raise more questions than provide answers about the Trinity, so let me just get that out there. But I hope you will join me on this journey as we continue to journey into the mysteries of our faith. There are many qualities that I strive to nurture in my son. I try to nurture his deep affection for those he loves. I try to nurture his sense of humor, even when his jokes end with a well-placed waka waka, and he thinks he's the best thing since Fozzie the Bear from the Muppets. I try to nurture his attention to detail, which continually amazes me. I try to nurture his affinity for music in all forms and his curiosity. Now, for those of you who have met my son, you can probably do some math and guess that we are past that why stage of parenting, where a child who's um, just entering preschool um, punctuates every sentence with the question, why? All right, let's wash your hands. Why? Because it's time to eat. Why? Because it's breakfast. Why? Well, because we haven't eaten yet and you need energy for your body. Why? Because food helps give your body energy. Why? All right, we could do this all day, right? We are past that stage. But our child is now learning that one exciting way he can engage his curiosity is by asking good questions. 
He knows he can ask these questions of himself. He can ask these questions of the world around them, and he can ask these questions of others. From here, he can gather information, try to tie it together to see what he might learn. It's a process. It's interactive. But it starts with him and his questions. So sometimes for a quick answer, he'll do what many of us do. He'll say, hey, Siri, what do ants eat? Or if we're visiting my sister, he'll ask Alexa, hey, Alexa, why don't dogs talk in the same way people do? And then he'll roll over laughing when Alexa's reply doesn't come out in English language, but rather through a series of barks. Try it if you have Alexa. <laughs> and let me know if you get a different answer because we want to know this thing at our house. Now, while I may not have the best or correct answer to his questions, I love that he asks them. When he says to me, Mom, why do we have blood in our body? Mom, how do you think Pluto feels about being a dwarf planet now? Mom, when is this virus going to end? See, asking questions is not just how he learns, but how all of us learn. There is a value to our naming the concerns on our hearts, the curiosities that tickle our brain, our interests in the world in which we live. Now, many of us are old enough to know that questions don't always have answers. In many, perhaps even most cases, questions lead to more questions. Questions help us notice that many things in this world are layered and complex and certainly interconnected. In my case, questions keep us humble, honing our awareness not only of the details and and intricacies of the world around us, but also of areas in which our, my own or our own skill and tools are limited. Questions help us understand our world, and questions are tools that enable us to gain greater understanding in our world. Questions help us name problems, problems that create come to a scientific hypothesis, but also the problems we see in society around us. Problems of division and hate. Problems of why some people have and others have not. And questions help to articulate the next step forward for questions unleash change. Now, I am not making this up on my own. As much as I like a good question, our gospel lesson, in fact, introduces us to this truth. For John introduces us to a man of many questions. Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, comes to Jesus at night filled with questions. Now, his arrival on the scene in the middle of the night raises some questions for the readers. We're not sure why he approaches Jesus in the dark of night. Maybe he's embarrassed to be a leader who has questions, as we see so many leaders in our world are afraid to admit on their own. Maybe he's afraid of what people will say when he's with Jesus. Those who had positions of authority were not quite sure what to make of Jesus. What would they think of Nicodemus by his association with this strange man? Or maybe Nicodemus, like many of us, was lying in bed at night, trying to answer the many questions that were swirling around in his brain, and he knew that there was no way he was going to get a decent night's sleep unless he got out of bed and did something to address these questions at the heart of the matter. Whatever compelled him, Nicodemus arrives before Jesus with some observations and some questions. He says he knows that Jesus comes from God, but how? And then, Jesus, how can anyone be born again after they have already grown old, and how can it be? How can it be, Jesus? Just all of it. Jesus, rebirth, the Spirit's power. Now, I will confess, as one who has read and studied this text for years, 
I think our passage raises more questions for me than it does provide answers. Like Nicodemus, I would not mind if Jesus' answers were a little more straightforward and a little less like riddles. I wouldn't mind some greater detail about what it means to be born from above or be born from the Spirit. But really, at the heart of my questions is the word belief. When Jesus says believe, believe what? What must belief look like in order to inherit eternal life? What if beliefs are different among those who desire to follow God? What if belief waffles and wavers and changes over time? What if we believe some things but wonder about much more and can't help but doubt a lot too? And what on earth happens to those who don't believe what we're supposed to believe in order to inherit eternal life? (sighs) But then I am reminded that raising questions is a mark, a quality of dynamic faith. There are some who mistake questions for doubt and more than a few who likewise mistake doubt for disbelief. But Scripture shows us over and over again that questions and even doubt help us to engage the mystery of our faith. Questions help us explore and understand God's engagement with the world and help us to even understand our own inability to fully understand the divine. Questions allow us to come humbly before God, explore how God is at work in the world and even present in our daily lives. As Miss Sarah said, and as the bulletin says at the top, today is Trinity Sunday in the liturgical calendar. Long ago, it was decided that the Sunday after Pentecost would be named a day that would reorient the church universal toward the power and presence of the triune Godhead, the one in three, parent, son, spirit, creator, redeemer, sustainer. Now this is a claim about God that I have heard my whole life. Like many, I was taught that this is how God is. It was a given. Every night as we gathered around our dinner table and I sat with my dad to my left and my mom to our right, we began our meal with the same sign, the sign of the cross, an invocation of God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This opened our prayer, seeking blessing upon our food and giving thanks for the gifts we have received. This one God, three persons, one hope for the world, three ways of engaging God's creation. I owned that the mysterious part for me to grasp was not that God could love the world in different ways or that God could make God's self known using different techniques and devices, but rather that all three persons in the Godhead would exist all at once, all the time. The more I learned about the Trinity, the more I was clear, the more it was clear to me that this doctrine was simply the church's way of exploring the question, who is God? It was the church's collective set of questions unleashed by the presence of Jesus. The church, much like Nicodemus, wondered how could the church remain its belief in one God if Jesus is so clearly and so fully aligned with God? Was Jesus one with God or God's own self? Was Jesus the firstborn of all creation, a creature like us, or somewhere in between, a demigod of sorts? And where did that leave the Holy Spirit? that was gifted to the church too? Was the Spirit subordinate to Christ? Or was the Spirit one with God and Christ? And how could we understand the Spirit since, after all, the Holy Spirit is named in Hebrew texts 
before Jesus incarnate even entered the scene. See, I told you, I don't know that you're getting many more answers, just a lot of questions. But here's what the church said. In 325 of the Christian era, the Council of Nicaea constructed the doctrine of the Trinity to try to hold together these questions in mystery and awe. They strove to address these questions by affirming that yes, Jesus is God and the Holy Spirit is God too. The fancy word to which Miss Sarah referenced um, in her children's time is the word homoousius, same substance. That there is one God, one divine substance, but that this Godhead consists of three relationships within God's own self and extending out in love to God's creation. Creator, redeemer, sustainer, <clears throat> parent, child, Holy Spirit. God within God's self is relationship. God within God's self is love. Let's be honest. We hear this doctrine of the Trinity and we echo Nicodemus' words, how can this be? It is impossible for three to equal one and one to be three. The tidiness of this construct is messy. It begets more questions and a slew of helpful but quite imperfect analogies to try to assist our understanding of the Trinity. So let me introduce you, if you haven't already heard, to a few of these analogies. <clears throat> Many Sunday school classrooms and confirmation classes and pastors like myself will offer the analogy that God is like water. Always the same molecular compound, H2O, but found in different forms, ice, water, vapor. Now, while this analogy offers us a consistent image of one substance in three forms, with three ways of relating to the world, this same molecular construct cannot exist in all three forms at the same time. The triune God, however, is always creator, always redeemer, and always sustainer. God is not a holy shapeshifter that changes between sh creator, Jesus, the Holy Spirit in our midst. So the analogy only works if H2O can remain ice, water, and vapor, all three, all the time. Analogy two. God is like an apple, one whole, one essence, one purpose in the world, but distinctly different parts, seeds, flesh, and stem. So this gives us a way to name the unique attributes of each person that is a part of the larger whole, but we run into problems when we notice that each element of the apple is only a part of the larger whole. With God, each person in the Trinity is always fully God all of the time. And the third analogy I'd like to offer today is where I put Pastor Randy on the spot and I say God is like Pastor Randy. God. So Pastor Randy, we'll start with Pastor Randy, who is a father, a husband, and a pastor all at the same time. And he is always each. He is always himself. He is one person with three different ways of relating to the world. So this analogy works well as we examine an expression of how each person of the Trinity embodies a different way in which God might relate to the world as one who creates, as one who redeems, as one who sustains. All right, now here's the pickle. Not to pick on Pastor Randy, but our analogy falls short when we observe that Randy only relates to Ian and Charlotte as father, or Beth as husband, or to us as his congregation. And that each of these distinct relationships had a start date. God, however, 
relates as creator, as redeemer, as sustainer to all, all of the time for all of eternity. Friends, we soon see what Nicodemus saw. The closer we get to understanding God, the more questions we have. The more we try to put God's nature into words, the more we try to make comparisons to, between God and the creation God has made, the more questions we have about God's nature itself. The more we learn, the more we wonder. The more we seek Christ, the more we, are, we ask about how we are to live like Christ. It is as if we just found the piece of a puzzle we've been looking for, and we see where it fits into the larger whole. But as we place the piece down in the puzzle and step back, we see that the puzzle will always require more pieces than we will ever have at our disposal to see it to its completion. So just maybe, with all of the questions it contains within, the doctrine of the Trinity might offer us a North Star to help us navigate the questions of our heart, the questions that are fundamental to our lives, lives as humans, the questions that I would offer are fundamental to our life as a people of faith. See, for this Trinitarian understanding of God always holds before us a truth, a truth that is claimed in a verse of Scripture, a truth that is emulated throughout all of Scripture, the truth that, simply put, God is love. The doctrine of the Trinity holds the truth of a God who, in God's own self, embodies and emulates us. And this love extends outward to all of creation. The Trinity articulates that the most fundamental quality of God is love. And the most fundamental call at the heart of our life of faith is a call to love. And God's love is not only evident in mighty acts about which we read in Scripture, but is witnessed each morning with a new sunrise, in a robin's egg we find in a nest out back. It is witnessed in every act of repentance and forgiveness extended. It is evidenced in every choice to not give up, to keep pressing on to make society more just, more welcoming, more equitable, more fair. It shows up in every band-aid placed on a skinned knee, every mourner who is held in the grasp of one who is close. God's love is revealed when we notice a unique characteristic in someone who is so different from us that we might never fully understand them. And yet we sigh and we notice that they are beautiful and worthy of love. God's love is found among us as casseroles baked by neighbors, in music that calms our troubled spirits, in every conviction that every embodiment of systemic oppression must end with us today. See, the triune God bears witness to this love among us as God continues God's work of creating, redeeming, and sustaining here and now in our lives and in our world, modeling our inextricable connectedness to God and to each other. The doctrine of the Trinity reminds us that our lives are woven together as we live in God's image as God's people. We are reminded that when one of us plants a tree, the air we all breathe is improved. 
When one of us scrapes the window of a neighbor on a snowy day, the roadways are made more safe for all. And we, when we catch our collective breath and choose a kind word in a moment of angry conflict, we model that something new is possible with God's help through us in this world. See, the triune God orients us continually to the fact that we are made for love. As individuals and as a community, God's vision for this world is love. In spite of our best efforts to build a kingdom based on hierarchy and wealth, oppression and greed and violence, God breaks through our own sinfulness and even our suffering and asserts that love is the greatest power. Love has the power to heal, transform, forgive, and make all things, even us, new over and over again. So perhaps the most faithful thing for us to do this Trinity Sunday is to ask a lot of questions. Maybe we are to stop and sit and look in our world and say, where is there a need for God's love? Maybe we are to stop and look in the mirror as we're brushing our teeth and say, where is God calling me to love? Even as we approach God with our questions, maybe we are to notice that God holds out a question for us as individuals and as God's church. Beloved, child, made in my image, redeemed by my grace, sustained by my spirit, how will you share my love? So siblings, how is God's love evident in our lives, through our lives? How might God's love right now be changing us and working on us and stirring within us and calling us forth and sending us out and strengthening us and our world? Let's wonder, what might our lives, what might our world look like if we focused on love, what might be different if God's love through us was visible in this world? I'm not going to offer any answers today. I'm going to offer an invitation that you will join me in the questions so that we might see God and one another and God's world with greater clarity and awe and uncertainty. Then I'm going to offer a prayer. God of love, may it be so. Amen.